Hi everyone, I'm Mark in the UK marketing team. That's right, Mark by name, marketing by nature. I'm just relieved I didn't become a constable. Now, I'm here to talk to you today about something very close to my heart. No, not angina, silliness. And in particular, the benefits of humour at work. In fact, I was going to call this talk the importance of humour, but I didn't want to sell myself as a comedian, and I thought the word silly might pique your curiosity. And as it turns out, it did. Sorry for the clickbait, but like I said, marketing by nature. Now, I'm not a professor or a psychologist or even a stand-up comedian, which is why I'm in marketing. But I do have a background in the entertainment industry. And yes, I'm aware that makes it sound like I did adult films. And to be honest, I only wish I'd been that successful. But for many years, you were far more likely to find me hosting a game show on a cruise ship than giving a talk. And I thought that when I switched careers and went into marketing, that I'd have to be serious to be taken seriously. So for a while I approached everything with a fastidious dedication to always be showing to everyone just how hard I was working. Look at me, I'm smart, but please don't look too closely or you'll see I'm a fraud. Imposter syndrome. It can be the absolute devil and can prevent us from having a good work-life balance. It raises our stress levels and affects our work and personal relationships. And I don't say this as some sort of guru, I say this because it's something I battle with all the time. But in order to adopt silliness and humour into your work life, I believe the first step is to acknowledge your worth. So let me say this before we get started. You're here at Klarna for a reason. You have specific skills, knowledge and values that make you vital. You know much more than you'll ever realise. Got it? Good. Because, my God, if we work for 70% of our lives, it really ought to be fun. You know, the average person spends 13 and a half years at work in their lifetime, but only 380 days socialising with friends. And I don't even want to begin thinking how that average has taken a hit in the last 12 months. The film director Peter Ustinov said, Comedy is simply a funny way of being serious. So, why is humour important? Well, here's the first big insight, and actually, it really isn't very funny at all. A survey in 2013 of 1.3 million people across 166 countries found that the frequency with which we laugh or smile starts to plummet at age 23. The average four-year-old laughs around 300 times a day. The average 40-year-old takes two and a half months to reach that same number. And during a pandemic? Well, let's not even go there. But that stat is shocking. When you think that kids are laughing at a brown dog or Peppa Pig jumping in a puddle. As adults, we're sophisticated. We have the ability to observe comedy in anything from politics to religion to Arsenal Football Club. And yet clearly, most of the time, we don't. Are we too cynical? Too busy? Too important? And of course you might say, well babies are idiots, they can sit about and laugh at nothing. I've got a job to do. And that would be fine if humour weren't so vital to our happiness our creativity and our overall health. So what are the benefits? Well, there are two key benefits to bringing your sense of humour to work with you. The first benefit is on our physical and mental health. Bear with me, I'm going to go all science on your asses. When we laugh, our bodies release dopamine, which makes us feel happier. But it also increases oxytocin, which increases bonds and trust. In fact, big increases of oxytocin occur during childbirth, during sex, and in laughter. Now, I'm not in HR, but I'd wager only one of those three isn't a workplace violation. Laughter lowers the levels of the stress hormone cortisol and releases endorphins that can create feelings of euphoria. It really is quite the cocktail. Think of a child at Disneyland on Christmas Day with a puppy. The second benefit is on our work life. It helps establish connections with our teammates. It expresses our personality and unlocks creativity. It can also help us get noticed and gain status. Basically, we need to balance out all those bottom lines, the QBRs and the performance reviews, with the lightness, the humanity and spontaneous joy of life in order to achieve harmony and avoid burnout. I'd like to demonstrate this by way of a dessert, in part because they offered a small expense budget on this gig, but mainly because it's delicious. Here's some fudge brownies. They represent the gravity of the workplace, your professionalism. It's weighty, it's complex, it's rich. Mm. 
it just burnt my tongue. I can eat a fair bit of it, but quite soon it becomes a bit too much. It needs something else. It needs some ice cream. Cart door, not mucking about. Now the ice cream represents wit and humour. It's light, it's silky, it's creamy. I'd almost go so far as to say smooth. On their own, they're great, but you can't have too much of either one before your palate gets overwhelmed. But when you combine them, not only can you eat so much of it you lose sensation in your lower limbs, each element significantly improves the flavour of the other. Mmm, delicious. So, oh, <laughs> so, okay, it does some cool chemical stuff in your body, but how does it realistically help you succeed at work? Well, the first area it can impact is power. Now, it may be a cliche, but the phrase open with a gag has its merits. Comedian John Sherman said, if people are laughing, it means they're paying attention. Breaking the ice puts people at ease. It can make you look smarter, perhaps even smarter than you are, and helps you to stand out. A man who really stands out and has already featured heavily today in our epic slow jam, Barack Obama, famously employed comedians to help write some of his speeches. This is a clip of one of his most famous jokes. I mean, it's no three nuns walk into a bar, but when you consider the setting and the context, the clever wordplay really does land. Then there's my favorite example. The interior department is in charge of salmon while they're in fresh water, but the commerce department handles them when they're in salt water. I hear it gets even more complicated once they're smoked. As people left the chamber after the speech, the audience members were asked to write down significant words they recalled from the speech. No surprise, salmon was the most remembered word. If you want to make a point, make a joke. Obama was a real advocate of levity and humour, and you only need to look at not only his popularity during his presidency, but the level of trust and connection the US people have with him. That's the oxytocin kicking in, people. While we're on trust, Maya Angelou said, I don't trust anyone who doesn't laugh. And her opinion is backed up by science. Studies of strangers who were asked to watch a humorous clip together were asked to send letters to each other afterwards. Now, their letters contained far more personal details than a control group who watched a simple dry news item. Their laughter generated trust. In a world where many of us still can't see our colleagues face to face, laughter is a quick-fire way to create bonds. Next up is creativity. As I said earlier, humour can unlock it. Now, I've got a challenge for you. So imagine this. You have a candle, a box of matches and some pins. And I want you to attach the candle to the wall and set light to it without wax dripping on the floor. So, how would you go about doing it? Have a little think. Well, when scientists got people to do this, they showed half the group a comedy routine beforehand and the other nothing at all. The majority of those who watched the routine had exercised the parts of their brain that the other group hadn't and were able to quickly figure out that they should take the tray out of the matchbox, take all the matches out, and attach it to the wall using the pins. That way you can use the tray as a shelf for the candle before lighting it, and it catches all the wax. Now interestingly, children can also solve this problem more easily, because they haven't yet learned something called functional fixedness. The group who hadn't seen the comedy routine were thinking laterally, and were governed by unwritten rules around the use of the items that had been presented to them. They needed to think outside the box, whilst quite literally thinking inside it. The fourth area humour positively impacts is our resilience. Making light of a difficult situation can not only improve the attitude of those around you when done appropriately, but it can give you more stomach for the fight. Not only does humour relieve stress, it can be vital in moments of distress. You know, finding humour in the most difficult times can be a lifesaver. Let's face it, we know the last 12 months have been a nightmare, but even then, I bet you've had real moments of laughter. I'm not saying it's a silver bullet, but maintaining a sense of humour in the darkest times helps protect us and allows us to enjoy the good times when they do finally come along. I'd like to highlight a recent piece of accidental workplace humour that I'm sure you'll be aware of. Play the tape. I've always wanted to say that. Mr. Ponton, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to... Uh... 
Take we're a trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live. That's not, I'm not a cat. I can, I can see that. Um, I think if you click the up arrow next to this. I mean, it's gold. There's so much going on here and it teaches us so much, not least the perils of letting your kids muck about with your work laptop. But first of all, the setting. That legal situation makes it even funnier, but apparently only for us, the viewer, the judge and the opposing lawyer don't raise a smile. They're only thinking about their objectives and their professionalism. They left their sense of humour at the Zoom waiting room before they entered. But once this went viral, I'm sure all parties involved found it hilarious. And yet they didn't allow themselves to laugh about it at the time because of a subconscious concern about being unprofessional. The man's a cat, for Christ's sake. What's wrong with you? And yet, do we think any less of the cat lawyer in question? No. I mean, I wouldn't ping him for tech support, but it wouldn't stop me asking him to be my lawyer, especially if it were for perjury. If it happened to us, we'd be horrified. But when we see it happen to others, we empathise, we relate, we laugh, and we share it with the world. If we can't laugh at a lawyer who's accidentally turned into a cat, then we might as well just pack up and go home now. It's a moment of humanity in an otherwise sterile and manufactured environment that we all recognise. It's so relatable for a COVID world coming to grips with how to manage our careers from our kitchen tables. Oh, you know what it's like, we're apologising for the drilling, the children, the toilet flushing, the doorbell ringing, as if we're in total control of our environments. Let's drop the facade. Right now, we're not in control of anything. Embrace it. That video went viral on the day I started working on this talk, so I became a bit obsessed with it, and I found the judge from the clip. He was tweeting pretty much all day about it, and he said this, These fun moments are a byproduct of the legal profession's dedication to ensuring that the justice system continues to function in these tough times. Everyone involved handled it with dignity, and the filtered lawyer showed incredible grace. True professionalism all round. Just want to pick out a couple of words here. Dignity. Grace professionalism. That's quite the opposite of how it might otherwise have been perceived. These are the moments that not only make work fun, they make life worth living. Again, embrace it. Judge Roy also tweeted this, almost as if he knew I was tracking the story with the specific intention of highlighting the importance of laughter in a conference-style environment to prove a point. So pleased to have started a tweet that started the whole world laughing. The world needs more of it. Hashtag smile, hashtag laugh. I imagine that in a courtroom environment, it's probably quite common to have moments of humour and laughter, especially when you're dealing with some of the most serious and complex human issues. Much like laughing at a funeral, it's actually more common than people think. But much like the non-feline judge and lawyer did in the clip, it can pass us by. Perhaps with working from home, we're not finding it quite so easy to express ourselves. It's harder to make a point and be heard and understood let alone share a joke or a little aside. And I think it's actually increasing our desire to show that we're working ever so hard. Inevitably, it means our days are now filled with call after call about the matter at hand. There's very little spontaneity, no surprises, no deviation. Now, the cat video, in fairness, is just an accident. And I'm not suggesting that you play Russian roulette with your Snapchat filter the next time you're on a call with Sebastian. But there are subtle ways of dropping humour without accidentally going viral. So I'd like to suggest a few usable tips you can adopt to add more humour to your day, particularly in these work from home times. Because you might say, but Mark, I'm not funny. And I'd say, how do you know my name? Go away. But look, it's a fair point, but it's actually not important. It's really not about memorising a load of dad jokes, although there are worse places to start. It could be simply about allowing yourself to enjoy the moments of humour when they arise. Smile more, laugh, share that moment, don't let it go. If you're on a call with a lawyer who turns out to be a cat, well, afford yourself the opportunity to enjoy it, please. So, here's some quick hacks to get humour into your daily life with minimum effort. 
Firstly, you're out of office. How many times have you gone to write an OOO and thought, God, these are boring. You give it two seconds, thought, and then you just write what you always write. Something like, I'm out of office until Monday, July 10th. If you need immediate assistance, please contact blah, blah, blah. Boring. But we all do it. It's as predictable as a password starting with a capital and ending in a one. Yeah, that's right, I'm talking to you, safe and up. We all want to be creative, right? But in a busy day, that's just something else we need to tick off the list. But if you're going on annual leave for two weeks, this might be your most highly engaged email of the year. And I know, that's a depressing thought, isn't it? But my point is, why not make it count? So, here's an improved version for you that you can borrow. Thank you for your email. I'm currently out of the office, staycationing in the dining room for a change of scenery. Yours will be my favourite email to respond to upon my return from my travels on July 10th. Second tip, how about spicing up your email sign-offs? It's another underused area that can create a real impression and help you stand out. Instead of thanks or best wishes, how about congrats on getting to the end of this, have a biscuit, hakuna matata, or my favourite, I'm not a cat. Thirdly, let's cut the crap. We've all adopted corporate jargon into our vocabulary and it's as contagious as, well, a virus. Through COVID, written communication has increased massively and our emails and our Slack sound nothing like how we actually speak. And although there's nothing inherently wrong with buzzwords as a communication tool, it does mean we're all starting to talk a bit like robots. And this restricts our personality and our creativity and it actually makes everything sound more complicated and laborious than it needs to be. Deloitte actually became so concerned by this <clears throat> pandemic that they created software that would rank emails on a bullshit scale and provide word substitutes in an effort to humanise their consultant's email language. And because I only have 20 minutes here, you'll just have to take my word for it that it worked. So, let's play bullshit bingo and see how widespread the problem really is. Full disclosure, I use all of the following terms every day, usually before lunch, to the point where it's taken over the way my brain actually works. In fact, in response to a text from a friend arranging a Zoom call recently, I replied, let me run that up the flagpole and pressure test it. To which my friend replied, is that code? Are you in some sort of trouble? So what I'd ask you to do is see how many times you hear, read, or use the following terms in one day. Maybe take a little screenshot once they all appear on screen. Sync up, stick a pin in it, circle back, move the needle, touch base, peel the onion, drill down, do you have bandwidth? Needs wordsmithing. Again, these are all useful terms that we all understand. But would it not be just as easy to say, let's abandon this, it's not working, rather than some weird nonsense about pins? Or, may I suggest, do you have time for that instead of a mid-90s reference to broadband? It might help us get where we're going quicker at work and help to repair some of the friendships in our personal lives. If you're still not convinced about the power of humour, well, how about this? According to a recent survey, 98% of exec leaders preferred employees with a sense of humour, while 84% believed employees with a sense of humour do better work. Now, I think the most amazing thing about those two stats is that it means 14% of CEOs prefer employees with a sense of humour, even though they don't see any specific commercial benefit. Presumably, they just prefer people who like a laugh. You're never going to say on your deathbed, God, I wish I'd written that email to marketing about the incorrect font size on that UK Instagram post. What's up, Brand Studio? Thanks for stopping by. No. Instead, you're going to say, I wish I'd enjoyed each moment more. I wish I'd laughed harder and loved longer. So let's start now. Thanks for listening. Hakuna Matata.